Great. So welcome, everybody. It's great to see you all here, and it's great to see the interest in what are really re very important issues for uh, those of us who are uh, in, in education. Um, and I think that even an awareness of the issues is a hugely important starting point, and hopefully we can all learn together. Um, Dari spoke about the various learning outcomes from today's conference, and I suppose what I'm going to be focusing on for you is actually the law itself. Um, I know that Darius is far more technically able than I am and will talk to you about things like the process of um, sourcing and using uh, protected uh, material that is, 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 uh, can be, has been put up to, to allow you to use it um, without breaching copyright law. Um, but I think most importantly, and perhaps this is why I'm first as a foundation block, I'm going to just talk you through some of the, you know, the main governing provisions and more specifically in the education context, the various ways in which we can actually use material that is otherwise protected and exclusively within the use and the remit of the copyright owner. So I suppose in that context, just to present you with a, an overview of, of my talk, um, <clears throat> we'll start with some of the very basic things like what is copyright and who owns the copyright, how long does it last for, importantly when is a work deemed to attract copyright protection, so what kind of a work uh, is protected, in other words we look at concepts such as originality, literary work, the notions of skill and judgment um, and the manner in which they must be exercised for copyright to subsist. Then we move on, quite logically, I hope, to the rights of the copyright owner. So if you do own the copyright, what does that mean? What can you do with the work? And what can you prevent others from doing with the work? And then getting down to what I think is kind of the meat and substance of today, which is, uh, <coughs> I suppose, gaining an understanding of the fair dealing exceptions under Irish uh, legislation, which is, obviously, as you probably know, hugely influenced by European legislation. So I've broken it down as per the provisions of the legislation. So we have this notion of fair dealing, but unlike other jurisdictions, particularly the US, and Owen will probably mention this to you later because this, we may be going in a different direction following on from the, the committee's report, but at present our fair dealing exceptions are expressly you know, uh, provided for and the parameters are very clear that they relate to use in education, use for criticism or review, and incidental inclusion of protected material within your own original work. Um, so we look at those and, and, and the way in which they are currently drafted um, in legislation. Moving on from that then, <clears throat> we're going to look at uh, reliance upon licenses, which is essentially a way of sidestepping what you might regard as the conservative limitations of the governing legislation. So we will look at the notion of licenses very briefly, but more specifically, again, seeing as we're in a third level education institution, we're going to look at the, the existing license that is mandated to exist for third level institutions, that is the license with the Irish Copyright Licensing Agency. I go I'll through all this, but just by way of introduction to note that the legislation actually mandates that we have an arrangement with the publishers in Ireland who sign up to the ICLA, which give us slightly more freedom in relation to the use of copyright protected materials, both us as educators and also our students as private researchers. So we will look at that and the more permissive ex exceptions to copyright protection that that provides for. And then briefly at the end, I want to just touch on the rights of employers, those of us who are employees, for example, within a third level institution, to what extent do we own our own material? To what extent do our employers own the material? The legislation starting point is that the employers own anything that you create in the course of your work. That's obviously something we might not want to agree with. And so I need to refer you to both um, possible exceptions within the legislation, but also the importance of the individual employer employee contract or arrangement. And specifically, I'll refer you briefly to the, for those of you to whom it's relevant, but I think it's a good guidance, the UCC <coughs> IPR policy and the way, in, the way in which UCC positions itself vis-a-vis -vis my work as its employee or, or anybody else's. And interestingly, the students' work as well. And finally, I just want to highlight the fact of moral rights and just explain, hopefully in about three lines, what they are just by way of completing the package. So that's the plan for the next 20 minutes or so. So we don't have much time, so I'll start. So um, I'm just going to speak to the PowerPoint. What work is protected by copyright? Okay, the governing piece of legislation is the Copyright and Related Rights Act of 2000. Lucky for you, most of you don't have to read this. This is the basis of my IP LLM module for the, uh, the LLM and IP um, and... Um, it is a huge piece of legislation and on one level it's hugely welcome because we were very much behind the pre previous legislation was from 1963. We were very much remiss for many years. We did not comply with our European or international obligations. And so we finally did in 2000 and did so admirably, but I do mean that in the condescending tone that it sounds because we missed out on lots of issues. And also if you think about it, 2000 was kind of a very much a changing time and all the digital capacities that we have now simply either didn't exist or if they existed I didn't have a clue about them and maybe you might have been the same and so I think the legislation didn't envisage 
um, perhaps reasonably, all that was to come in terms of our capacity to share information lawfully or otherwise. Um, but that's the legislation that we're working with for the most part at present. Just referring to section 17, which refers you to, um, to what kind of works would be protected by copyright. So obviously originality is key, and I'm going to touch on that in a moment, but it refers to the scope of works that would be included. So just on the slide there for your information, literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, sound recordings, films, broadcasts, or cable programs, typographical arrangement of published editions, original databases. I mean, they would be the main, the main block of, um, of works. And interestingly, when we look at the exceptions, We'll see, for example, that educational exceptions in respect of literary works are slightly more permissive than those in respect of sound recordings, and we'll, we'll go through each of those. And it's just interesting to see the different uh, allowances, depending upon the nature of the work that's being protected. Yeah. Yeah. Site design, website design, and software. You see, um, yeah, and I mean, maybe my colleagues might speak more to that, but a literary work is becoming more and more broad. A literary work includes in its definition, which perhaps <coughs> deserves another slide, a computer program. And so in the earlier legislation of 1963, obviously that wasn't included, it wasn't envisaged. Um, the way in which you, so if you create a, is it a web page you're talking about her? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the content in itself would be a literary work. Yeah. So the, the words that you put together on the web page, that's a literary work. The fact that it's presented on a web page rather than a piece of paper, that's not relevant. So does that answer your question? Okay, great. Um, so, you know, moving on to that, what is a literary work? Well, it covers any work that is expressed in print or in writing, which would include your example. Um, does it have to be brilliant to get copyright protection? Absolutely not. It doesn't necessarily require that it's any good, that its quality is any good, as it says on the slide. It does not mandate a high standard of style or quality. So the worst essay that you receive from your student that gets maybe 10 marks out of 100, it's still original. Original, not very good, but it's original. So my point is that quality is not necessarily relevant. That's not to say everything that's written down is a literary work. Um, I found a couple of very old cases one, uh, the person uh, alleging that he could assert copyright protection, it was in respect of what was referred by the court as unintelligent scribblings, apparently written while he was in an intoxicated state, and the court was satisfied that it did not constitute a literary work, it lacked any effort or information. There's this like judgment call there, you know, and you don't see this very often, but I thought it useful to put it up on the slide. But for the most part, any literary work, any work that is expressed in print or writing that is original um, will have copyright protection. The obvious next question, um, do I have it? it relates, I'll come back to that, is in relation to the original nature of that expression. I think it's important to follow on with that. Um, what is required to show originality? Um, obviously, that's an area where contention can arise very easily. Certainly, the court must be satisfied, if there's a case at, at issue, that there's evidence of the author's own skill and labour. Okay. So you'll see on the slide, the originality which is required relates to the expression of the thought. Darius and I spoke about this, and I think we're both going to touch on this, the notion of the idea that you've expressed versus the expression in itself. You know, ideas can't necessarily be owned. In fact, we know now they can't be owned, and that's provided for in the legislation. Copyright only is, only attracted, is only associated with the expression of the idea. So if I write a piece on a certain, an article on a certain piece of legislation, and I have an opinion or an idea about that, and I express that, the way in which I've expressed that is protected. But I don't own that idea. Because if we could own ideas, we'd kind of run out of ideas relatively quickly. So the important point is, is that this is known as the idea versus expression dichotomy. So you own the expression of the idea, you don't own the idea itself. I often give this very simple, silly example in my class. I might as well share it with you. Um, you know, the notion of you know, the Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks movies, where you know, a boy meets a girl, they fall in love, they have this lovely you know, six-month happiness, and they have a big fight, they break up and then in the last scene they get back together. Okay, very simple, but that's the idea behind two million films, none of which are probably worth watching, but the point is that they're all expressed and presented differently um, to a point that they're not copies of each other. There is an element of originality, an element of the author, whoever that might be, his skill or her skill and labor, and that's what separates them. So it's the manner in which you express what may be a shared idea, a shared notion, and that's where the protection subsists, but you never own the idea itself. Very simply, the, court, the work must not be copied from another work. It must originate from the author. So again, I know you can say, well, that's a matter of opinion, whether or not there's sufficient <coughs> distinction between the two expressions for uh, copyright to subsist in the second work. Um, you can take it that there's quite a broad view, uh, quite a generous view taken of the notion of originality, and you don't need an absolutely profoundly original expression, you know, so long as there's evidence, we say, of skill, labor, and an element of originality, and a lack of evidence of copying. 
In adjudicating those kind of cases, obviously the detail of the expression will impact upon the assessment of the originality. So the more detail, the more novelty involved, obviously by definition will suggest originality. But the courts have accepted that there's a relatively low threshold in assessing the notion of originality. Um, as I say, there's no protection of the ideas, the protection lies in the expression, and that's where the originality must lie. So going back a slide, my order was slightly wrong. What is copyright? Maybe this should be slide one now that I look at it. Copyright is a property right, um, which um, the courts have kind of grabbed onto that for some time now, but it's very useful that the legislation in 2000, for the first time under Section 17.3, expressly provided that copyright is a property right. And in the Irish context, if there's any other lawyers in the room, this is you know, quite profound because property rights are, are respected and uh, protected under the Constitution. So if you wanted to make that sort of an association, it certainly suggests that copyright is held in quite high esteem under Irish law. Copyright, as distinct from, for example, patent protection or trademark protection, subsists automatically. So you don't have to, you know, there's this notion that you post the work to yourself once it's written and then you have, you know, proof of a date, which is all very well and everything else. But in terms of the fact of copyright <coughs> protection, that subsists automatically simply by virtue of the originality of the work. So if the work is original, copyright subsists automatically, no applications, no registrations. What does it do? Well, it permits the copyright owner to use the work in many ways, and that's a very positive right. In terms of regarding it as a negative right, it is a right to prevent everybody else from using the work in that way, and we look at the uses in a moment. Um, how long does it last? Well, in respect of literary works and an awful lot of original works, it lasts for the whole life of the author plus another 70 years. The historical notion being that when someone creates an original work, they're entitled to be rewarded for that work, right now, but also their, um, their ne the next of kin are entitled to be rewarded and to be rewarded for a 70 year period. I mean, it's quite a contentious issue. There is a very um, strong school of thought that suggests that people don't create original works to provide for their grandchildren and that it's excessive and that it's excessively restrictive for society to gain access. But in any case, we've only been moving in one direction. The most recent development was in, 19, in the 1990s, whereby it went from 50 years to 70 years. So, you know, we're not moving backwards anytime soon, despite quite a bit of lobbying. To, to limit the time period of protection. Yes, we had that, didn't we? Okay, so just in terms of originality, this is just an interesting quote from quite an old case now, but it's very much held to be the seminal case on it. The word original does not, in this connection, mean that the work must be the expression of original or inventive thought. Copyright acts are not concerned with the originality of ideas, but with the expression of thought. And in the case of a literary work with the expression of thought in print or writing, the act does not require that the expression must be an original or novel form, but that the work must not be copied from another work. That is, it should originate from the author. So in terms of originality, it seems that so long as you don't copy somebody else, the law is probably on your side. Facts dependent, of course. So that's just more on the low threshold. One interesting thing there, work must show no literary or other skill or judgment, but must simply originate with the author. So I think we've killed that point to death now. Um, so the rights, what can the copyright owner do? Well, this is very simply stated, and this is provided for the legislation and will be very typical internationally. So the copyright owner has the exclusive right to use or authorise others to use the work. So very much a control thing. Has the right to copy the work, make the work available to the public, distribute the work, make an adaptation of the work. Okay. So that's, I think, very obvious. What can the copyright owner prohibit others from doing well? Somehow, in terms of repetition, that can prevent others from doing the following. Reproducing the work, publishing the work, performing the work, broadcasting the work, or making an adaptation. So where we want to use work that is owned by someone else, that someone else has the copyright in, on the face of it, the legislation is hugely restrictive. We cannot do any of those things without their consent. Okay? The good news is we have exceptions, and I guess that's one of the most important things about my presentation today is to ensure that you understand what are those exceptions to copyright protection, what can we do, um, and particularly what can we do within education, um, notwithstanding the fact that on the face of it there is copyright protection on the work in question. So the legislation sets out two main heads, and those, that would be the notion of fair dealing, which has three sort of subdivisions, and secondly, education. So now we'll deal with those separately, obviously. And then also, the other way in which you can have exceptions to copyright protection is through a license, an agreement with the copyright owner, either you know, a two-person agreement, just the two of you agreeing the way in which you can use that work, or arguably there may be a more universal license in place that allows all particular users, users within a particular category, to use that work in a certain manner, subject to the terms of the license. Okay? So in terms of the exceptions, we'll start with fair dealing. 
So fair dealing is sort of an umbrella heading under Chapter 6 of the 2000 Act and specifically is contained in sections 49 to 52. Oh, excellent. My, can I call you my pretty assistant? Is that very bad? Darius is going to distribute the relevant sections so you have them by way of reference, uh, supplemental to whatever I have on the slide. So the legislation is interesting because, you know, to contrast it with, I don't know if, you've, if you're aware of the notion of fair use in the United States, which is a much broader concept, and you can argue, perhaps before the courts, that what you have done was, you know, in the eyes of the reasonable man, a fair use of that work in the circumstances. Whereas in Ireland, we have a much tighter regime where it's, I suppose you could call it an exhaustive list of ways in which you can use work and claim that it's fair dealing. So those fair, those fair dealing exceptions are come within three headings, full stop. Okay, it's very limited. First of all, under the heading of research and or private study. Secondly, where you use the work for the purposes of criticism or review. And thirdly, for incidental inclusion. So just for clarity, education is dealt with subsequently, not in these sections. So these are separate to the educational exception. Okay? So if we start with the first of the three exceptions under the heading of fair dealing, we have research or private study. So this exception is provided for in section 49 relates to, uh, in fact, under section 50, relates to a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work, sound recording, film, broadcast, cable program, or non-electronic original database. To claim a defense under this section, the work which you have used or copied or whatever, must already have been lawfully made available to the public. Okay, that's the first box you have to tick. Secondly, the use you have made of that work must be for a purpose and to an extent which will not unreasonably prejudice the interests of the copyright owner. What does that mean? That's a matter for debate. It would depend on the circumstances. You would hope that the courts would take um, a certain view of what might or might not prejudice the owner if there was a case involving you before the courts, but that's sort of a vague notion that leaves scope for sort of judicial policy interpretation and intervention wherever appropriate and however appropriate. But that's as far as the legislation goes in terms of that type of test. The legislation also sets out what copying would not come within the exception, and that's interesting and perhaps helpful in so far as it identifies you know, where you're not going to win an argument if you've used it and claimed the defense of research or private study. So where the person copying knows or has reason to believe that the copying will result in copies of substantially the same material being provided to more than one person at approximately the same time and for substantially the same purpose. So all the lecturers in the room might be quite alarmed by that, but note that there's a number of qualifications and improvements on this since this provision was included. And also remember that the educational exception also exists, notwithstanding research and private study. Okay, so this really speaks to the individual researcher as opposed to the lecturer. I think that's very important to recognise that and to recognise the coexisting provisions in relation to education. Also, converting a computer programme expressed in a low-level computer language into a version expressed in a higher-level computer language or copying a computer programme in an incidental manner in the course of converting that programme also do not come within the exemption. I say that fast because I know very little about computer programmes. Okay, the next heading for... Um, fair dealing exception is criticism or review. So you are entitled to use work that is otherwise copyright protected if you're doing so for the purposes of criticism or review. However, you must comply with certain requirements. You must, in your piece, which includes the otherwise protected material, include a sufficient acknowledgement. And I, I have defined below that a sufficient acknowledgement, the legislation expressly says, requires that you include the title of the work which you're relying upon, also identification of the author, and any other description of the work that might be necessary to identify it. Okay? The criticism or review exception also includes the notion of fair dealing, so it allows you to fairly deal, if I can twist the words, with a work, once it's not a photograph, for the purpose of reporting current events, again, where you include sufficient acknowledgement. The third element of fair dealing under section 52 is incidental inclusion. So, you are not breaching a work that is otherwise copyright protected if you use the work in an incidental manner in another work. Okay, so for example, and I think this is useful, the last point, this exception permits the use of quotations or extracts 
from our work. And I think that would be where the notion of incidental inc inclusion that a lot of us might think about, a lot of our students might use. However, again, that work must already have been made available to the public, and again, that use must not prejudice the rights of the owner, and they must be sufficiently acknowledged, the original uh, creator of that work. If you use the work of another by way of incidental inclusion, that does not prevent you from making your work available to others. That's important. It doesn't restrict your use. Again, so long as it comes within the notion of incidental inclusion, as opposed to cutting and pasting the whole piece and putting it in and saying, well, you know, it's just incidental inclusion. It's not incidental, obviously, if, if you're using a substantial piece. Um, so again, just to repeat that, there is this sort of umbrella provision that says that it will not be regarded as incidental inclusion if you've unreasonably prejudiced the rights of the copyright owner. I often think that that might refer to the notion of if you use so much that it would inhibit perhaps the sales of the original work because they don't need to buy the original work because you've used so much. But for example, I think that might be where they're going with it and that might be a way of testing whether or not there has been an unreasonable prejudicing of the rights of the original creator. So that's the fair dealing umbrella. Second, I suppose, umbrella could be regarded as the education exception and that's specifically provided for in sections 53 to 58 of the 2000 Act and again Darius has distributed a copy of those provisions to you. Um, so this exception on a broad level, before I get to the specifics of the individual sections, authorizes the use of work that would be otherwise be copyright protected and by definition not available for use where it's within the educational context and it complies with the provisions in the legislation. So what the legislation does in sections 53 to 58 is set out an exhaustive list of permitted acts, as I say, subject to multiple conditions and prerequisites. Okay, so let's just look at what they are. So when you look at the wording, um, I think it's useful, and to me it sounds quite permissive. So it says that copyright, and I, this is where the distinction lies between the different forms of works. So we'll start with literary, etc., etc. So copyright in a literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic work shall not be infringed by its being copied in the course of instruction or preparation for instruction. So if you're copying the material for the purposes of giving a class, that will not constitute a breach of copyright, so long as... The copying is done by you or someone on your behalf, you as the instructor, sorry, I'm presuming. So copying is done by or on behalf of the person giving or receiving instruction. Copying is not by reprographic means. So that's, you can't use a photocopier, for example. And the copying is accompanied by sufficient acknowledgement. If you tick all these boxes, it's okay because it's for the purpose of instruction. Just by way of contrast, if it's non-literary, so if it's sound recording, film, broadcast, etc., etc., it shall still not be infringed, same context, except you can only make one copy. Okay? And the one that's missing is you can't do it by reprographic means. So you can make a copy of these forms of original works, but you can only make one copy. Okay? Other miscellaneous provisions related to the educational exception. You are permitted to make a copy for the purposes of an examination, which is quite timely, by way of setting questions, communicating questions to the candidates, or the answering of questions, but this exception does not permit the making of a reprographic copy of a musical work for use by an examination candidate in performing the work. So if you have anybody in the music world, that might make sense. Um, infringement does occur for an exempt copy. So you've made your copy, you came within the terms of sections 53 to 58, but that copy is subsequently sold, rent or lent, or offered or exposed for sale, rent or loan, or otherwise made available to the public. So it, the copying must be very much within the examination context, within the instruction context, and only for those purposes. Again, thinking of the notion of unreasonably prejudicing the rights of the owner, for example, that that would very much kick in then. If you are operating within the context of original works that are performed, played or shown, um, there are other limitations. So in an educational establishment, you are permitted to use the work that is otherwise protected um, in the context of performance, playing or showing work, but there are rules. For example, the audience to whom you are presenting the performance or to whom the students are presenting the performance must be limited to persons who are teachers in or pupils in attendance at an educational establishment or other persons directly connected with the activities of that establishment. Performance by a teacher or pupil or performance at the establishment by any other person but within the confines of the establishment is okay so long as it's for the purposes of instruction. So you're, you're performing at what is otherwise a copyright protected work, but you're doing so within the lecture room and it's the students who are doing the performance or you're doing the performance as the instructor that takes you outside the, the notion of breaching that copyright. So long as there's nobody else in the room except the students and the instructor. 
interestingly, it specifically provides that mommy and daddy can't come in and watch Johnny on the stage, that that's expressly, they're expressly not included as persons within the exemption, which I always think is interesting that they thought to put that in expressly. Um, so very much for the benefit of the instructor and the students, it's okay. As soon as you open the door any further, you have breached the copyright. What's the purpose of the camera? To whom will you be sharing, showing? Uh, there's a camera light, okay, but if you have the consent of everybody in there, and who are you going to show that recording to? That's the key. If you're recording, my take on it would be that if you're recording to show it back in the class the next day and say, this is what you did right, this is what you did wrong, that's still for the purposes of instruction. Would you agree? That would be my take on it. If that's, is that your question? Yeah. <coughs> as soon as you start making DVDs and selling them for a tenner, you know, then you're in trouble. Okay. Okay. Next obvious question is, well, how much can you copy uh, if you can use reprographic means? Um, so even though I said earlier, you can make copies, but you can't do it reprographically, there are exceptions um, in relation to copying on a buyer on behalf of an educational establishment. Um, but even though I have this slide here, and this is governed by the legislation, this has very much been surpassed by the <coughs> ICLA license that exists. So every third level institution has an assigned license. I have it here and it's available on the UC website, for example, but also the ICLA website, whereby we have um, education license agreements which set out the extent to which we can copy and the extent to which our students can copy. So as in interesting as this slide might be, I think it's more useful to point you to what is actually the governing provisions. And they are the governing provisions because the legislation mandates that these regulations were set up and that the universities signed up to them. So what we have here is, for those of you who are not familiar with it, and I'll speak from the UCC viewpoint, but it applies to all third level institutions. Um, we have an agreement signed with the Irish Copyright Licensing Agency. And uh, the first agreement was signed in, and I have it here in front of me, and I have the reference on the, I have a, the 4th of July, 2005. And what this does is firstly, it overrides the limitations of the statutory provisions that I've just set out, okay? Not hugely, but it, it's slightly more generous. So the use by our students and by us as lecturers is limited and defined by the terms of the license. So the license originally, in its original format, July 05, was simply for non-digital copying. The good news is that we had the good sense to extend it to digital copying uh, and electronic copying in January 06, Blackboard, etc., etc. Okay, so what does the license say? Well, the original ICLA license from 05 permits UCC staff and students to copy extracts and, tell, and we go on to the extent to which they can copy. It uh, sets out the scope of what are regarded as licensed material. It requires the copy to be of an original work. So you go to the library, the original book is on the shelf, you can copy it, okay? Um, and the licenses on this link, and I think you're all gonna get these slides afterwards so you can, you can read it up yourself. Um, what does it permit and what does it, how does it define the right to copy? <coughs> well, to copy is to make or permit the making of a photocopy or any reproduction of licensed material. So here we had the reprographic process being introduced as lawful for third level institutions. Thank God, says everybody, because everybody's at it, okay? So as of 05, we can now copy any work that's included within the permitted works, and it's defined with reference to the publishers. So if you're copying work from a particular publishing house, it comes within that. The list of the included publishing houses in Ireland are attached to the license, and interestingly, it sets out the excluded UK publishers. So we have a very long list of included Irish publishers, excluded UK publishers. And that's what it means to copy, and that's what's permitted, but expressly excluded the right to copy by electronic or digital means. Okay, um, and it, this is what it allowed. It allowed the copies to be made by employees or students or stu staff to make them available to students so long as it wasn't in connection with any commercial activity. You could not copy more than 5% or one chapter of a published work. I think that's recognized as the norm in any case. You could copy a whole article, but not more than one article in any publication. You could copy a short story or poem, so long as it wasn't longer than 10 pages. This is all in the license, and it's stuck up all over the wall of UCC library. Other issues from that original agreement, you had to copy from the original. You, can, and you could make copies, but the number of copies you made could not exceed the number of students in a class, plus two copies for each lecturer, teacher, and I always think tutor. I always kind of throw that in myself hoping that it's okay. Um, so you can actually make a copy for everybody in the audience, basically, is, is what the position is. And that's not generally known. There's sort of a fear about making and distributing copies. 
Uh, it does permit also, you know, course packs, so you could put together some material so long as it comes within the list of uh, included publishers. You can make those available to the students. You can charge them for them insofar as, you know, a five or a pack, because that's what it copies to, costs to photocopy them and stick them all together, but nothing more than that. You certainly can't sell them or rent them. Um, and still then there was no electronic copying and you have to refer to the, publish, or the publisher and the author. And I'm under time constraints, so I'm going to keep going. In 06, we had an extension which basically allowed us to do all those things, but to do so electronically. Okay, so um, you can't put things on the World Wide Web. You can't email material to students. I think I have that on a slide somewhere. Um, do I? Yes. So it is still the 5%. Uh, you can't manipulate or change material. You can't put it on the World Wide Web. You can't send it my email, but what you can do wonderfully is you can put it, for example, on Blackboard. So you can put an article that is protect, that comes within the terms of what's permitted and you can put it on Blackboard. Why? Because there's a very limited, very exhaustive list of persons who can access that. So it, that is lawful. It's an extension of the non-electronic copying. You know, six was extended to digital copying. Does, does that make sense? Darius is kind of waving at me to finish up, so I'm yeah. going to just keep talking. Okay, um, okay, these are things you can't do. So you can't make CDs and DVDs of them, you know, making new forms of the material that you're copying. You can't store it except for technical backup, okay, which Pat makes us do a lot. Okay, so this is just the notion of, well, who's included? Well, there's a schedule to the agreement. Um, publishers in Ireland are expressly provided for, as I say, they list the publishers who aren't included from the UK. Okay, this is just a comment to the end. One more minute. I mentioned at the start of the presentation I wanted to touch on employer rights, and I think this is important um, because the legislation starting point, the legislative state of starting point under Section 23 is that if you do something in the course of your employment, your employer owns the IP. Okay, and that's, as an academic, that's a bit troublesome. And there's also the issue of us as academics, you do some of your work at work and then you do it on a Saturday evening and then you do it on a Monday night. And so, you know, is it a computer you got from work? Is it your own PC? All those issues. If there was a big case, I think it would be very interesting to see how late into the night we all work um, and whether it was our own laptop or whatever. All those issues are relevant. Um, I think, and, and thankfully, the university has a policy uh, for the right and, and the wrongs of that policy. So the point I'm making is that your employer-employee contract is obviously hugely important because that can override the, the starting point of the legislation. I do just put the UCC IP policy um, for what it's worth on the slide, and I see Hilda there, so um, I won't say anything bold, but um, it's interesting and it's not clear because the first thing it says is that, and I literally cut and paste two small bits, so it's obviously out of context, but it says that the university owns all IP rights in works generated by staff in the course of their employment by the university and students during the course of their study. And that's where we all run out of the room screaming because that's very alarming. But then they have a specific provision relation to copyright. And it, when you read the whole policy, it's very evident that it's quite patent oriented, the notion of someone coming up with a great invention and then the university getting their cut. When you look at it, they specifically say about copyright, but the university does not assert ownership of copyright or pedagogical, scholarly or artistic works, regardless of their form of expression, unless there's a written agreement to the contrary. So they won't assert any rights in your work, except, as I've always said, if someone breaches your copyright, you're going to probably have to get the university to come on board and issuing the proceedings, because even though they don't assert the right, Apparently they own it. Do you see? So as a lawyer, that to me, you'd have to get UCC on board if there was an issue. Also, um, who owns the moral rights? The moral rights, and I promise I'll finish now, Darius, the moral rights is where even though you might sell your copyright to the publisher and get your million or whatever, um, you will always retain the paternity right, the integrity right, the false attribution right, and the right to prevent mutilation of your work unless you waive it. So you'll always be the author. You'll always be able to prevent publishers from saying, oh, that paragraph in chapter six is actually useless. We cut that out, sure, sure, we give it her money, she sold the copyright, we can do what we want. They can't, because you have the moral rights. It's like it's a part of your creation, it's part of you. You'll always have that claim on it, unless you waive it. And so in the event of a dispute, you wonder, would UCC have to, I don't know how we'd work it in terms of issuing proceedings. But just to know the fact of moral rights, even when you sell your copyright, it's like the work is like your third arm and you'll, you'll always own it, irrespective of selling the copyright. So you always have a claim on the way in which it's presented and the fact that you were the author. And these are the remedies for breach. If you ever have to sue anybody, the good news is that there's finally agreement across Europe about enforcing IP rights. There's an enforcement directive, which if I talk about now, Darius will kill me. So point to the Creative Commons project. I know that Darius is going to talk to you about it. I'm just mentioning because Darius and I are the... The, the two people behind the um, uh, Irish partnership um, in relation to Creative Commons, and it's a wonderful way of owning your work. If you think the copyright legislation restricts people's capacity to see your work and use your work in a way that you want them to be able to, well then you publish it through Creative Commons license and then you dictate the extent to which people can use it. 
And I think that's really important as people involved in the academic world where we don't necessarily want our work to be so restrictive in terms of its availability. Okay, so that's me done. Thank you.